You go from this place determined that it'll be all out to the end. And if you've come here in a state of lukewarmness, shed it here and now. If life is a vapor, you've got little time in which to live the rest of your life. God, who yes, is love. God, who is great and just and merciful. Because in his being, he is what he is. is a God who is angry at evil and sin. I had the honor and uh, privilege knowing Martin Holt for a little over 20 years. I remember him as a sincere, passionate and prayerful Christian and I preeminently remember him as a passionate and experiential expository preacher. God has a big, big plan for the future. And what Christians, and they the only people in the world who can think this way, God's plan for us does not end the day we die. That's when it really only begins. Martin was a tremendous preacher, expositor of the word. And it's because of his influence that many youngsters will follow in his footsteps. I thank God for the life and the legacy of Martin Holt. If I can say this to you quickly, sometimes you and I hear of some tragic fall of a Christian, even some who apostatize, just turn their back on the faith. Why hasn't it happened to you? His power. His power. He's held you in his hand and he won't release you because of his inheritance in you. In my association with Martin Holt, goes back nearly 50 years. He is remembered by me as a visionary, someone who saw opportunities to extend the kingdom of God when others didn't. He was a warm-hearted Calvinist who believed and faithfully preached the whole counsel of God as set out in the Baptist Confession of Faith. Allow me to say, I think there's something wrong with our generation of Christians. If I think back of South Africa and of the Dutch Reformed churches, especially in the Western Cape, in the time of Andrew Murray, before and after, you know, they used to have their Saturday afternoon preparation for the Lord's Supper. Why? Because the leaders of the church did not want people to come and just to sit and to let it be a vain, meaningless repetition. Whether you have that or not in your church, see to it that you prepare. One day, in the Lord's providence, out of the blue I got hold of a small magazine called Reformation Africa South with an article in it by a certain Martin Holt. And with every sentence in this article, I was wholeheartedly in agreement. Without delay, I got hold of Martin's details, phoned him, and the rest is history. We became good friends, enjoyed wonderful times of fellowship, and shared pulpits. Martin's passing not only came as a shock, but also as a personal loss. I think you know this <coughs> doctrine of substitutionary penal atonement is under attack today. We have, amongst others, professors in the theological faculty of the University of Pretoria who say that to teach that or to preach that is to suggest and imply that God is guilty of child abuse. Well, when people say that, when people teach that, when people preach that, they are guilty of heresy. When it came to the cross because it was the will of the Father to crush him, he became obedient even to death, even the death of the cross. Now why in the world would God the Father do that to his beloved Son? Because he loved his elect people. And he had a plan and a design by which the load and the weight of sin could be shed on the grounds of the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The thought of him who 
gave his life a ransom for many. And if you are included in the many, shame on you if it never reduces you to tears. Martin Holt was, in my experience, the first bold, practical, a coherent and overt Calvinist that I ever met. Makes me think of Dr. Willie Murray. Years ago he told of a young man who was furious after he heard a very stunning sermon on sin. And he said to Dr. Willie Murray, I will enjoy my sin. And Dr. Willie Murray said to him, yes, you'll enjoy it until you can't enjoy it anymore. Take note. We live in a day and an age when even within the Christian church there is far too little of a brokenness of heart and a mourning over sin. God give it back to us because when he does we might be a step closer to revival. One day I was shattered by her prayer. She said this, weakened by this ugly cancer and her life wasting away. This is what she prayed. Lord, please deliver me from mediocrity. I want you to interrupt and say, my dear, shouldn't you rather pray for grace to hold out to the end? Weakened as she was, because of the cross, because of what it meant to her, she did not want to end even that life at that stage with mediocrity. God give me the grace to pray that to every day and you. Why? Because love so amazing, so divine demands my life, my all. David, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about your father today. I think let's start with the first question. Uh, your brother Jonathan said, uh, one of the greatest gifts my father has left us is his godly example. Can you give us a couple of memorable occasions that you remember as a child where you experienced your dad as a godly man? Thank you, Fadi. It's uh, good to be with you today. Thank you for having me and for giving me a little part to play in this wonderful recollection of the life of my father. I think the thing that stands out probably as being the most profound was the part of his life that very few people saw. What they saw was a an overflow of what I saw and heard. And that no doubt was what I experienced coming from his prayer closet. I can remember waking up in the early hours of the morning, uh, around three o'clock in the morning, and hearing him praying and hearing him agonizing in prayer for those in his church, for those of his family, hearing him praying for me. And this was something which happened every single day of his life as a believer. And many times when I would wake up, I would hear him praying and real, real deep prayer where you knew that he was standing on holy ground, a holy ground that he'd entered into by the grace of God and experienced that wonder of being in the presence of God as he prayed. And I know that many of those prayers were answered and I believe that many of those prayers have yet to be answered, and that is an exciting thing. Another aspect of his godliness was seen in his witness. He had a passion to share the gospel. So most people knew him as the man who stood in the pulpit and preached with power and passion. But then very few people saw him when I saw him as a, a young boy who would take every opportunity, be it that he might have been collecting uh, a bunch of flowers at um, the florists or that he was purchasing an item from a supermarket. Never an opportunity went by 
when he would share something of the truth of his Saviour, whom he knew and loved. I could go on, but time is limited, I know. But those two stand out immediately as you ask that question. Thank you, David. Yes, that is remarkable. Uh, it reminds me a bit of my mother as well, that she grew up in a praying house and uh, she was a very rebellious teenager. And one day one, her brother uh, in the kitchen told her, I'm going to pray for you until the Lord Jesus Christ saves you. Now, now, David, you've got a very interesting story yourself. You, you became a DJ at 5FM and your father actually talks about that in the book. Uh, and uh, he thanked the Lord when you went to Europe and uh, about when you were 22 you came back and then you left that and your dad was so thankful and he said it was an answer to prayer uh, can you just tell us a bit briefly about that how you came to faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and maybe also a bit of maybe a difficult time in your life that you went through you know Fadi, I was thinking about uh, something around my father's prayers for me earlier on today in fact and I've thought about it numerous times, just with regards to his parenting. I think each one of his children went through certain rebellious stages. And I don't remember him, apart from the times when he would, he was a faithful disciplinarian when we required it. But then when we were beyond the necessary warming of the buttocks, and we were teenagers and young adults and really tasting the world. I don't remember many conversations that he had or rebukes that he had for what he no doubt perceived he, his children, his, his dear young people in the family were up to. But I know that he was praying. And if anything, I want to say there's a very real lesson to me as a parent now, and I have children who are young adults who at some times they engage in activities which really concern me and I'm challenged to do what my father did was to pray and yes so he prayed uh, he never told me what he prayed about I may have heard little snippets in the early hours of the morning but uh, nonetheless I always grew up believing but what I lacked was a genuine relationship. I always grew up with a sense of fear for this holy God that had been presented to me so faithfully over and over again in my childhood and teenage years. But I grew up with a desire to enjoy what I perceived was a better life in the world. I had a dream to be a radio DJ and God, for whatever reason, saw fit to grant me my dream uh, and it came in the form of 5FM. But nonetheless, I had gone away traveling in Europe with a friend of mine who was, is a believer, and I was struck by his relationship. He also came from a Christian home. But I was struck by the fact that every day he apportioned time to spend with the Lord. And I'd never really gotten into that. Um, I had prayed before. I had had times when I'd read the Bible intermittently and consistently. But there was something consistent about his walk with the Lord. And when I came back from my trip overseas, I determined that if God was to be had in relationship, I wanted to have that relationship. I did not want to live my life on the back of my, Christ of my parents' faith. If this God was real and if the God of the Bible was real, as I believed he was, I wanted to know him for myself. And I went through a period of about six weeks really searching and it was a dark period. I remember being challenged by my brother who said, Dave, what's up? What's up? You seem so down, so, so depressed. I was dark. Things were dark. But the Lord really took me through a dark place so that when he shone his light, I knew it was him. <laughs> and I just remember coming through that period. And uh, it wasn't that there was a particular sinner's prayer. In fact, I'd prayed a sinner's prayer numerous times when I was a child and a teenager but this was entering into new life. It wasn't about a sentence or a few sentences in prayer. It was entering into relationship, what I'd longed for. And so that for me was how it all came to be. And the prayers of my father, and I don't want to forget my mother, they were partners in prayer. Uh, they prayed together. They were burdened together. 
but the Lord was faithful and he saved me. And so that challenges me to pray each day for my children, to pray for them when they seem to be given Christ and uh, his truth very little attention, to pray on and to recognize that God hears and he is busy. And when he works, he works according to his plan and his purpose for his glory. And I will get none of it. If anything, all that I get is the grace of God to be able to plead. And he gives the grace to save. Praise the Lord, David. Thank you so much. And I think uh, if the Lord would have given your dad just a peek from heaven, I know he won't. I think he would be so thankful to God that God has opened up ministry opportunities for you where you are doing audio books. Uh, you've done work on Spurgeon and you are busy with the, uh, with the English Bible now. So we Praise the Lord for his wonderful grace and work in your life. Uh, we can talk the whole day about the doctrines of grace and the great platform that your father created with conferences, the Grace Ministers Conference. Uh, he taught uh, in the Dutch Reformed Church. I'm going to talk a bit about that now. One of the things that I just want to say about the doctrines of grace that I really appreciated about your father was he, dis not despite, but the, the remarkable thing was he believed and he taught the doctrines of grace systematically his whole uh, career. But that was not a hindrance for a deep, passionate commitment to gospel mission, spreading the gospel. So his belief in um, election uh, and all of that did not hamper his missionary zeal. And I really, really appreciated that. But what I want to go to now is your, your father was um, an Englishman who could speak Afrikaans and he had a particular love for the Afrikaners. Now, that's where my story intersects with your father. Um, he, uh, I became a good friend with him in 2001. Um, I went to the Grace Ministers Conference conference there. He gave me this book uh, from Ian Murray. I met Ian Murray there at the time. Uh, and then I became a theology student in the Dutch Reformed Church. And your dad became a mentor to me as well. Um, I, when I was finally sacked from the faculty for standing up against liberals, and your dad played a key role in that by giving us good books to, to disseminate among the students, um, your dad uh, wrote to the papers when I was banned and saying this banning was one of the most shameful days in the history of the Dutch Reformed Church. And then he also wrote shortly before he passed away, he, he wrote a recommendation for my book that was published in South Africa. Um, but he, he was quite outspoken also about the theological liberalism that was developing in the Afrikaans churches. Can you just speak to uh, th that love your father had for the Afrikaners? Can you just unpack that for us in a bit more detail? Yes, you are right. My father had a, a very real passion for the Africana. I'm not sure how well this is known, but much of his early years was spent speaking either Afrikaans or German. He was both of those before he was English. Um, that only came later on, although he probably sounded more English, but he spoke Afrikaans like an Afrikaana, um, certainly in my ears. But I think behind it all was a passion for communicating the truth to the Afrikaner. Not that the Afrikaner was without it, but it was a desire to speak the truth to anyone. He, he loved the word of God. And so when the Lord placed a burden on his heart to minister the word of God, he sought to use those gifts of languages to communicate that truth to as many as he possibly could. And so his Afrikaans just got better and better until he was able to communicate it in such a way that he could speak to the heart of the Afrikaner as if he was one of them. I'll never forget someone once saying to my dad, I think it was uh, an African man of uh, Zulu origin, once said to him, you know, when you speak to us in your language, you speak to our heads, but when you speak to us in our language, you speak to our hearts. And I think that's perhaps what made him so effective in his ministry to the Afrikaner. And your question had to do with his passion. And indeed, as I've already mentioned, he had a passion. He spoke uh, Afrikaans to our neighbors whenever he had the opportunity. He took the opportunity to speak at um, conferences in Afrikaans when he had the opportunity to do so. Um, he was invited by various um, Afrikaners, including on one occasion, if I remember correctly, he was invited 
by the old National Party um, cabinet to deliver a devotion on one occasion. Now, you need to understand that he wasn't a supporter of the National Party. He was vehemently opposed to apartheid. Uh, he was vehemently opposed to the injustices. But when he was asked, as he became better known among Afrikaners, uh, he took the opportunity. And um, so, yes, his passion for Afrikaans was more about his passion for the truth. The, his ability to speak Afrikaans fluently and like an Afrikaner was because of his desire to speak the truth in love. And for that reason, I should say that uh, when he went, by the time he died, he was learning numerous black African languages as well. And the first thing he would do when he came across someone would, would, would be, what is your language? And if they said Zulu, he would say something in Zulu to them and actually engage in a bit of a conversation or Sutu or Tosa or Tswana, whatever it was. Um, he saw language as a vehicle to get into the hearts of men and women and boys and girls to share the truth of Jesus. Thank you, David. Yes, that is remarkable. I can tell you many stories of Dutch Reformed Church pastors. Um, he taught at the very famous Linwood Ridge Dutch Reformed Church since 1986 until he passed away. He taught Romans there. They were hundreds of Dutch Reformed Church people who attended his courses. He was very popular. He was on Radio Pulpit. Uh, so he had a tremendous impact nationally. Um, but let's move to a, maybe a more difficult issue. And I think you will be able to give us maybe some insights into that. Your father did go through a time of spiritual depression. I think it was nine, in the 1980s. You might have been a boy in, uh, in the house at the time. Do you remember that? And can you also maybe just speak to pastors who might face the same kind of challenge and how did your father work through that difficult phase in his ministry? Yes, it was during the 1980s when I was uh, in my teens, in the late 80s and not in my teens, in the early 80s, but it was for a period of about five years and perhaps during that time as a child I might have sensed a certain distance, but by and large I think I was protected from it. And I only discovered this great depression that he'd been through later on when I was mature enough to be in conversation with him about it. But I cannot say, I cannot say I remember the cause or what he put down to being the cause of that depression. Nonetheless, I'll never forget what he put down to being the the remedy from that place of depression. And essentially, it was through some counsel that he received after five long, dark years when someone counseled him to make an effort every day to make a note and use a notepad and a piece of paper. And look, it was much more profound than this, but I'm just giving it second hand. But using a notepad and a piece of paper to write down everything that he could write down that he was grateful for. When we're in a place of darkness, it is the darkness that consumes our, our minds. And so we, we don't see the light that is there. But when we are forced, when we discipline ourselves to pause and say, okay, what do I have to be thankful for? And so we start to focus on the light. We start to focus on those things for which we ought to be giving God praise for. That we begin to move from that tunnel into the daylight. And so in a nutshell, that's really what it was. It was coming out of a place where he was consumed by everything in his mind that wasn't right by that deep place of depression to that wonderful place of release. Learn a lesson. You know you may be in the worst possible conditions. There's always something to thank God for. I had to learn this when I had five and a half years of prolonged depression. Shame, my poor wife and family had to put up with a man like me. It was terrible and I'm ashamed of myself. But what I had to learn to do was learn what the Apostle Paul did. Not look what you haven't got, look what you've got. 
And they couldn't take away the Lord Jesus Christ from him when he was in prison. And whatever happens to you, you can learn from this. Praise the Lord. Yes, when we go through difficult times, I often like to read Philippians or Ephesians and always also remind my children uh, when we go through difficulties, Paul is writing from jail that we should be grateful and thankful for the goodness of God in our lives. David, let's finish uh, and ask you to wrap up for us. If your father were given the opportunity, we know he won't, uh, but to come and have a cup of coffee with us today, what do you think? His advice will be for the church in South Africa? Fadi, that is a great question. And I wish I could ask him that question myself now, but I somehow feel that I may have the answer. And I draw from a few little snippets of my experience of him, particularly towards the latter end of his life. But I'll never forget on one occasion when I went out walking with him. We used to sometimes run, sometimes walk in the uh, early morning hour. And we were having a conversation and something strange happened in his pace. It was almost childlike where he, he almost picked up a bit of a, a hop and a skip like a child in a playground. And you need to understand that at the time he was a man in his 60s. And it was something very sweet and very beautiful. But as his pace changed and as he picked up this bit of a hop and a skip, he said, oh, if I could, I would skip right into heaven. There was this longing for glory. There was this longing to be with Christ. And so if he had the opportunity to come and sit with us uh, having a cup of coffee I am quite confident that he would say, you know, everything that I said about the doctrines of grace, true and precious and powerful, everything that I preached from the pulpit comes down to this one thing, Christ in glory, and we're going there. Even those who serve him can get so bogged down with what's happening in the here and now, that we lose our zest and vitality from what may be obtained by lifting our eyes and seeing him and getting that hop and a skip. And as I say that, I'm reminded of those words in Hebrews 12 verse 2, where the writer says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't think, certainly not in my lifetime, has there ever been a time as challenging as we're living in now for the believer. And for the pastor who desires to be faithful for the, to the truth, has there ever been a time where you feel more pressured to compromise and if not compromise to be silent or to perhaps be quiet. And my dad would say, along with the writer of the letter to the Hebrews, Hey, fix your eyes on Jesus, fix your eyes on Jesus who for the joy set before him. Well, what is our joy? Well, our joy is Jesus. Let's take this, lift up our heads. And as we do, endure the cross, scorn the shame, fix our eyes on Jesus. So all the profound theology that he was known for preaching so often would come down to this simple statement. Hey, fix your eyes on Jesus. There is joy to be found for our lives and ministry now as we draw from the joy that is Jesus then.
But one Sunday morning, I left church very, very discouraged. And so I went home, and uh, my dear wife said, Martin, all right, she could see I was down and crestfallen. Let's pray. She prayed such a beautiful prayer, and I muttered something, and uh, uh, you couldn't say amen quick enough, and got up and just went and sunk into my chair in the study. And my hand went out uh, thoughtlessly to this book, and I picked up this uh, plastic thing, see-through thing, and the card on top, this is what, it, all the cards were like this, but with different messages. Satan says, you're not getting anywhere, you might as well give up. I began to laugh, you know why? Because it's exactly what I was thinking. And then the next paragraph said, and God's word says. And then it had a verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I don't memorize easily, but when I need it, it just leaps at me. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then below that a little comment. I leapt up and went into the house. My wife didn't know what had happened. I was a different man. What a joyful truth to know that because Jesus Christ has died for me, I have been delivered from that fear of death. I know before I was saved, I lived with this fear of death. I knew the truth. Praise God that I, I had a godly father who preached the gospel. And I knew that if I died as I was in my sin, I would go straight to hell and I feared death. Someone might say, but aren't we under God's judgment? For well, sure we are. Romans 1 verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and wickedness of man. And yes, those who are living in unrepentant sin need to know that they are under the wrath of God and that they need to turn to Jesus Christ while he may be found, that they might be saved from their sin. They need to know that. that they're under God's judgment until they find peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. But as much as that I can tell you that we are under God's judgment as a nation, the world is under God's judgment, I can equally tell you that God loves the peoples of our nation. John 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world, and that's speaking of the peoples of this world. If I have to apply that to ourselves, then we can say, yes, God loves the Zulu people, and the Sutu people, and the Tswana people. And he loves Afrikaans-speaking people, and English-speaking people, and, and Germans, and Russians, and Chinese. He loves all the peoples of this world. Reverend Jonathan Holt, what a wonderful honor it is to speak to the son of Martin Holt, who is a pastor in a Reformed Baptist church in Pretoria. Thank you so much for your time. I had a lovely chat with your brother David a few days ago. Uh, and uh, today we speak with you about your father. A couple of questions that I think you will be in a very unique position to answer them. Uh, Jonathan, let's start with your dad's conversion. I found it remarkable how he narrated it. Uh, uh, all over his ministry over several years uh, it's a unique conversion because he had two conversions he had one Methodist conversion under the ministry of Hedley Sleeth and then he had a reformed conversion at Central Baptist Church after a prayer meeting the one tradition we know Arminianists they believe that you decide to be born again you have to accept God you take the initiative in a sense reformed Christians believe that it is the grace of God. God elects us through His grace and love and His predestination. It's a controversial doctrine. But your dad had a remarkable way of describing this conflict. So let's just quickly listen to a clip where he talks about this to, uh, with your mom. And then after that, you can try to unpack for us the theological significance of that. What has God done for us and where did it begin? Look at this. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, my friends, you know, let me try to encourage those of you who are still wrestling with the doctrine of election. I did for years. I did when I was in the ministry. Until one day, in my study, in Petersburg, my first church, I got on my knees and you know what happened? I said, Lord, I'm stopping to fight. If you say it, I believe it. I don't understand it all, but I accept it. 
And I got up from my knees and I went to the kitchen where my wife was preparing lunch. I said to her, Beryl, I believe in the doctrine of election. And she just about dropped everything she was doing. She was so shocked. And she said, what about my father? Now let me explain to you. Her father was as hard as a rock. Never went to church, anti-God, anti-Christ, and even almost anti-his son-in-law. But nevertheless, what was I to say to her? And God gave me the answer. And I said to her, you know, just think about it. If it depends on your father, he will never be converted. But if it depends on God, there's all the hope in the world. Thank you for sharing that uh, video clip with us, Fadi. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear of my father's conversion experience. Um, of course, his visit, first of all, to Headley Sleeth was because he knew he needed to be saved. He was missing something. And so it was a good thing that God was doing in his heart, preparing him for conversion. However, uh, what he heard uh, under Headley Sleeth was no doubt the gospel facts. The gospel facts in and of themselves um, are not enough to, to save. They are necessary, um, but mere head knowledge will not save anyone. And the problem with the Arminian way of evangelizing is once they present the gospel facts, then you simply have to do something in order to confirm your salvation, such as uh, saying the sinner's prayer, and maybe walking the arm, signing in a Bible that on this day you accepted Jesus as as Lord and Savior, and, and yet that can all take place without the heart really being regenerated. And that is why, uh, in my father's experience, he, he was not saved um, when he heard Headley Sleeth. He, he still uh, had this unregenerate heart and, and had not been delivered from slavery to sin. But when, on further seeking the Lord, and again the Holy Spirit working in his heart, and coming to Central Baptist Church and, and, and being in that prayer meeting, uh, no doubt the, the worship of Christ as Savior and, and just the confession of sin and the expression of faith in Jesus Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit used that to work in his heart and, and produce life, um, inner life that was so desperately needed. And at that point, there was faith in Christ and, and a spiritual change that took place in his life so that he... He left that prayer meeting a new man in Christ, um, in love with Christ, desiring to follow him and serve him. And so we, we just rejoice in the sovereignty of God in salvation. Uh, yes, he uses means. He uses the preaching of the gospel. Uh, and the facts of the gospel must be presented. But it's the Holy Spirit that must work in the heart to enable a person to repent and believe in the gospel. And that is what... The Holy Spirit did in my father's heart as he attended that prayer meeting at Central Baptist. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Yes, that is so wonderful. The way that your dad was able to explain the doctrines of grace with powerful, powerful stories. Uh, I've got a number of examples I can think of as well. I had a brother who wrestled with this issue. He went through a difficult period in his life where he feared that if he did one sin during the night, the next morning, if he didn't repent of that, he will be in hell. And he discovered the doctrines of grace in John Calvin's institutes, how it is God through his sovereign love and grace that comes through the Holy Spirit that saves us. Your dad specifically uh, talks about how we should then present the gospel. And he says here on page 32 in the book, he says, I prefer the biblical terms, repent, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we preach the gospel. We call people up, up to repent and the Holy Spirit works salvation in those who will come to faith. Now, let's go to the second question. Uh, we do have a problem in some Protestant churches of a kind of a hyper-Calvinism where they don't even do missionary work. I went to a church like that many years ago and it was so depressing. But your dad was different. He believed the doctrines of grace, but he believed in powerful gospel ministry and mission. Can you please unpack that for us in a bit more detail? Yes, my father loved the doctrines of grace. He believed that they magnified the glory of God. God in his grace is the one who saves. And no one will 
believe unless God in his sovereign free grace intervenes in a person's life and delivers them from their slavery to sin. Of course, having come to faith in, in God, uh, the doctrines of grace teach us that it's not because of our own doing, but because God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the earth was laid. And that fills the believer's heart with a deep love for God, that he should love an unworthy sinner. And, and my father loved these doctrines of grace and he preached them freely. But sometimes the, the question is put, but then you can't believe in evangelism. And that is completely false. Uh, and certainly in my father's case, he, he was very passionate about getting the gospel out there. In fact, in his early days as a pastor, he was a church planter and uh, planted a couple of Baptist churches uh, and, and preached the gospel. Uh, and there were many conversions uh, through his preaching. Uh, apart from that, I, I know that he himself uh, loved to witness one-on-one -on -one with people. As he would travel around, he, he could speak um, just, just the basic greetings in a number of different um, African languages. And so he would always ask those whom he met, do you have a Bible? And then do you read a Bible? And if they didn't have one, he would say, well, uh, how can I get you one? So he was very keen to get the word of God out. Um, I also remember how he um, how he wrote to me uh, when I was at varsity. I was lost. I was in my sin. And um, and I, I was under some conviction. But I, I said, I wrote to my father and said um, that I didn't believe that I was one of God's elect. And he wrote back to me and said, listen, that's not your business. That's God's. What God requires of you is that you repent of your sin and believe in the gospel. And so he had a, a healthy balance between, on the one hand, magnifying um, God and his sovereignty, but also recognizing that man is responsible to believe the gospel and calling and urging sinners to do so. And uh, so, yes, um, certainly the doctrines of grace did not dampen his zeal for the gospel and his concern for church planting and and getting the word out as far and as wide as possible thank you so much for that jonathan yes your dad did pioneering missionary work uh, conrad mbewe i remember ronald kalafungwe uh, you know before the new south africa your dad was also against apartheid so he had a missionary zeal to take the reformed gospel all across the world jonathan let's go to question number three uh, you are the only child of your father who's at this stage a pastor um, can you pl please share with us uh, a number of things that you learned from your father Father, that you are actually putting in place and actually practicing in your own ministry today? I think one of the biggest ways that my father impacted me was with regards to his prayer life. Those people who knew him uh, would have known him to be a man of prayer. Certainly that came through in his, uh, his prayers from the pulpit on a, on a Sunday as he led the worship, but uh, also in his study. In the early hours of the morning, uh, he would get up and and read the scriptures and spend um, a long time in prayer. Uh, I remember on the odd occasion walking past his study en route to my car uh, before I went off to work and hearing him fervently praying uh, out aloud. And that really left an imprint on my life. Another thing is that he he said to me before I went into the ministry, he said, the devil uh, brings down many men who are, who are careless and not watchful in prayer. And he said, there are three things you need to uh, pray against every day of your life. And that is sexual immorality, pride and covetousness. Or as uh, Billy Graham put it, fame, females and finance. And I always remember that advice and every day pray that the Lord would keep me from falling into those areas of sin where so many men in the ministry have, have uh, succumbed. And uh, so every minister needs to take note of that and really pray for God's protection uh, from the wiles of Satan in that area. Uh, just in another area where I know that he left the mark was just in his attitude to scripture. He loved the word of God and he would 
uh, try to read copious amounts of scripture, large chunks of scripture uh, at a time in his morning devotions. And he would often encourage us as well, read scripture and read lots of it. And uh, so, yeah, those were ways in which he certainly impacted me uh, as far as the ministry is concerned. Yo, Jonathan, thank you. I don't think there's ever been any better advice than that. I think all pastors can take note of that. We know of several international scandals the past couple of years, and I think your dad's advice is absolutely spot on. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Jonathan, let's move to the fourth question, and that relates to the Dutch Reformed Church. Now, your father preached in the Dutch Reformed Church. He was at the famous Bible school at Linwood Ridge Dutch Reformed Church. And unfortunately, a couple of years ago, the Dutch Reformed Church General Synod approved same-sex unions for pastors. Um, um, someone told me Conrad Mbewe finished his PhD under a supervisor. He did have an external examinator as well. But uh, Professor Nielus Niemand, who was the first moderator who supported same-sex unions, he has also uh, translated the emerging church into Afrikaans, and he supported the liberals at Pretoria University That's, that rejected the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and that whole story is explained in my book. So your dad was very much... Uh, standing for the gospel uh, within the Dutch Reformed Church tradition, uh, even the Linwood Riff Dutch Reformed Church, where he preached for decades uh, at the Bible school, they have got a professor at that uh, church now who took a compromised position on same-sex unions. It is tragic what has been going on. What do you think your father's advice would be for Christians in the Dutch Reformed Church and for pastors in the Dutch Reformed Church today? Yes, my father uh, would certainly have grieved immensely over the Dutch Reformed Church's general synod in approving same-sex marriages today. Yes, my father would have um, preached the gospel to all sinners uh, in love, including homosexuals, calling them to turn from their sin and believe in Christ for salvation. But he would never have condoned homosexuality or same-sex marriage. From scripture, he would have pointed to Romans chapter 1 and showed that homosexuality is in fact a perversion of uh, God's gift of sex. And um, in, in reality, uh, God handing people over to their sin in judgment. Um, he would have proclaimed very clearly that marriage is between one natural man and one natural woman. It is a covenant for life uh, that husband and wife are meant to keep. And so he would have called um, the Dutch Reformed Church uh, to repent and to turn back to the Word of God. He would have encouraged those faithful Dutch Reformed ministers to be unashamed of the gospel and to continue preaching plainly and clearly the word of God, despite the cost that that may involve. And I, I believe he would have been praying that God would raise up Martin Luther's within the Dutch Reformed Church, who will, who will contend against uh, the departure from the gospel that we see happening in uh, not just the Dutch Reformed Church, but in many church denominations today. Yeah, thank you for that, Jonathan. Um, for those interested in the book, uh, The Man in the Gap, there's a chapter by Errol Hulse, who was also a mentor to me. He was, of course, the pastor also responsible for Martin Hulse's reformed uh, theology. Uh, he's got a chapter here on the Afrikaners, where he discussed at length the history of the Afrikaners, but also a section on the Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, let me just read this paragraph that actually is quite relevant to what you just said. Errol Hulse said, Quote, I thank God that there are still some faithful men in the Dutch Reformed Church. The sad thing for many pastors there is that they would like to leave, but it comes at the ultimate price. Unless you have a 100% vote of all the people in your congregation, you lose your house, your income and your church buildings and for some even their cars. So many simply stay because they have very little option. 
So let's pray for men of God in the Dutch Reformed Church who will stand up. And I believe there must be dozens who attended the Grace Ministers Conference that your father organized. I saw Dutch Reformed Church pastors there. And let's call them up to repentance, to return to the gospel and not be um, manipulated by liberals who want to dilute the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jonathan, thank you so much. Let's finish off today with a last question for you. Um, can you give us an update and, and where we are about 10 years after your dad went to glory when it comes to the Afrikaans and the English Baptist Church in South Africa? Yeah, Fadi, I, I, I'm not sure how to answer the question on what the state is of the Reformed Baptist Afrikaans and English churches are 10 years after my father has gone to be with him in glory. Um, the Reformed Baptist Association uh, over 20 years ago dissolved and became part of Sola 5. Now, I'm not really involved with the Sola 5 churches, although I have very dear godly brothers in Christ who are part of the Sola 5 uh, group of, of pastors and churches. Um, I, I do know that my father was very passionate for the Reformed faith in our country. And um, he certainly did everything he could to encourage pastors uh, in the Reformed Baptist circles. Um, he was a leader amongst leaders. People looked up to him. I think he was uh, quite a uniting factor within the Reformed faith. Um, I think of the Grace Ministers Conference where... Um, reformed pastors from dif different denominations came and um, that was always such a, a great blessing and he, he visited many pastors whenever he could or picked up the phone and gave them a quick phone call to encourage them. Uh, I think he, he would have been concerned today with the, a number of reformed Baptist pastors who have emigrated for different reasons perhaps um, but uh, he had a, a real concern for South Africa despite all its problems and its and its challenges. And uh, what we desperately need to see in our country is God raising up godly pastors within the Reformed faith who will see themselves uh, as, um, as missionaries here, as it were, uh, passionately serving Christ in Africa because it is such a needy continent and certainly we're living in a very needy nation at this point in time. So, uh, yeah, we're grateful for the um, legacy that my father left in the Reformed Baptist circles and we continue to pray and trust that God will further that work uh, to the glory and honor of his name. Thanks so much for all the questions Fadi, really appreciate the time that we've been able to talk through these issues and uh, trust that the Lord um, blesses you and all your listeners. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for your time. What a great honor and privilege to speak with you. You actually took the boot on, on from your father and such an encouragement to see that God is building his church. As you were thinking about, uh, you know, the legacy of your father and what's going on right now, I was reminded of Spurgeon and this book that your dad gave me um, at the Grace Ministers Conference. He, uh, he even wrote his name in here and he gave me 1 Corinthians 15 verse Verse 58 that we listened to earlier already in this program. And I want to finish with a quote from Spurgeon. After Spurgeon died, uh, things changed so quickly. And uh, you should we, we should all be reminded that Spurgeon was also a pioneer who stood alone. His own brother voted against him at the, uh, the Baptist Union. He stood alone for the Reformed faith in Great Britain. And listen to this paragraph that Ian Murray wrote on the second last page of this book. He said, Spurgeon's voice had not long been silent when the new evangelical spirit, intoxicated with all that error, impressive, modern and sensational, swept all before it. When the Metropolitan Tabernacle, that's where he preached, was destroyed for the second time by enemy bombing in 1941, it was found that beneath the foundation stone, the confession of faith of 1680 was still where Spurgeon had laid it in 1860. 
my friends in South Africa, in the United States, in Britain, in Australia, who were impacted by the life and ministry of Martin Holt. Can I call upon you? May we repent and return to the God of Martin Holt, the God of our reformers, of Martin Luther, of John Calvin, of Spurgeon. And may we come and pray that God will send a new reformation back to the doctrines of grace, to the authority of Scripture. Friends, thank you for your time today. This is all we have time for. Let's finish with one little clip of Martin Holt on Revelation 21 and 22, sending us onward Christian soldiers to spread the gospel and know that the new heavens and the new earth is coming. And then, oh, praise God, he comes. Huge judgment separates, like Jesus said, the goats from the sheep. And believers settle down forever in a perfect state. And the wicked are damned. And you know what it's saying to you, young and old? Follow the Lamb. Because if you follow the Lamb, the end of the road is glorious. It is glorious. My name is Doug Van Meter and I'm the pastor of the Brackenhurst Baptist Church in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, the church in South Africa, including ours, uh, the one that I pastor, are deeply indebted to God for the life of Martin Holt, uh, his love for Christ, his love for the gospel, his love for the church, his zeal for the doctrines of grace, and his and his love for not only preaching them, but for practicing the grace of the gospel uh, has left a, a, a long legacy uh, here in South Africa. Grateful for this brother. Thank the Lord for his life. And one day, just the joy of being reunited with him in, in glory. I'm Pastor Joachim Rick uh, of the Eastside Baptist Church in Windhoek, Namibia. Um, and, uh, Martin Holt was a very, very dear friend of mine. Uh, he spent some of his childhood years, in fact, in Namibia, when his father served um, as a public official in this country. When I entered the ministry at Eastside uh, um, 31 years ago, um, he played a substantial role in keeping me encouraged in the ministry. Martin Holt was instrumental in getting me to South Africa from the United States. I had been a pastor in Florida, Fort Lauderdale area for years. And uh, as I was reforming in my theology, uh, I took a break from pastoral ministry and ended up in uh, Audubon Drive Bible Church in Laurel, Mississippi. Our pastor, uh, Jerry Marcelino, had invited Martin Holt to come and preach in Mississippi on a Reformation Day conference. My name is Ivor Jeffries. I'm from the Baptist Church in Kempton Park, South Africa. When I think of Martin Holt, I remember Martin lecturing the subject Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life at the Afrikaans Baptist Seminary in Kempton Park. So I studied under his teaching and lecturing and ways in which Martin has influenced me mainly is prayer, just hearing him pray, but also his example of prayer. And secondly, preaching, uh, expository preaching, a great influence that Martin had in bringing that back on the map in South African Baptist churches, Afrikaans Baptist churches especially, and then finally Reformed theology, uh, passing out books, handing out books, uh, being instructed in Reformed theology by Martin Holt. What a great example and a great man. And I praise the Lord for his ministry.